Merci. When I'm hitting a wall, instead of trying to bang my head against it harder, <laughs> I learned that day that my best bet is to actually walk away and allow some space and allow my brain to do the work without me being there with a whip behind it. Hi, I'm Dr. Irene O'Brien, and you're listening to Neuroscience of Coaching. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist with almost 30 years of study and practice in psychology and neuroscience. And as the founder of the Neuroscience School, I teach coaches and other wellness professionals practical, evidence-based strategies to use in their own practices. In each episode, I invite a seasoned coach to discuss a topic that clients struggle with. And together, we provide you with science-based tools to help your clients reach their goals by working with their brains to create results that last. So today, we're going to take an alternative perspective on pushing hard toward breakthroughs and putting in the hours of work toward a goal. We're going to look instead at the value of rest and downtime. Many people are familiar with the 10,000 hours rule that was popularized in Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book titled Outliers. The 10,000 hours referred to a typical amount of time that people were found to have put into their craft to be considered experts, whether this craft was music, sport, science, theater, or whatever. And while the 10,000 hours rule was accurate and based on research from the early 1990s, it only presented half the picture. The popularization of the 10,000 hours rule largely overlooked other behaviors and habits that subjects demonstrated in achieving their expertise. Specifically, as it relates to today's show, these experts only dedicated an average of about four hours a day to their practice. They weren't grinding at it 10 to 12 hours a day, the way many people assumed. They focused on the quality of their practice, not the quantity. Plus, they built an average of 3.8 hours of leisure time into each day. Not only that, these experts rested more than average for their age and demographics, typically an extra hour of sleep per day, as well as nearly three hours of nap time per week. Aside from this particular research, we also know anecdotally from biographies and autobiographies that many historical experts demonstrated the same from Charles Darwin to Winston Churchill to Stephen King. The neuroscience behind rest and recharging is quite fascinating. We can see in the neural activity of sleeping animals that their neurons effectively replay what the animal recently experienced while awake. This is theorized to be a method of memory formation, moving from short-term to long-term memory. It then stands to reason that this activity also helps to solidify the information in our minds that will ultimately lead to expertise with time. It's equally fascinating that we can see neurons trying different paths during sleep, perhaps reflecting variations of what was experienced while awake. This suggests that the insights humans get, particularly after sleep, rest, or relaxation, come from this period of neurons exploring alternate possibilities. This even sits behind people saying they get their best ideas in the shower. For most of us, a shower is a time of neural rest. Again, while the so-called 10,000 hours rule is valuable as a reminder that we need to put in the time and dedication toward expertise, we also need to remember the value of resting and recharging. It's been shown that spontaneous insights tend to produce better solutions than those that come from applied analysis but we can only get these insights from sufficient downtime. It's not a coincidence that the subjects in the 10,000 hours research put in four times as many hours into deliberate rest and sleep. So today we're going to remind coaches and clients of the value of rest and relaxation. We'll explore ways to reconnect with downtime and talk about the neuroscience of it all. And I'm so grateful to talk about this today with my fabulous guest, Anka Herman. Anka Herman quit her software career 20 years ago, moved to Spain, and turned her passion for sewing into a business specializing in flamenco dance costumes. Her business plan was simply, let's see what happens. 
She came to discover that building a business is a creative process, the same as developing software or sewing a dress, a magical mix of vision, skill, and soul. Now, she's a certified clarity coach who helps passion-driven coaches and educators build a boutique business without burning out. Thank you so much, Anka, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. So before we get into our topic, why don't you give us a bit more about your background and how that informed your work today? Well, thanks for the opportunity to come along and talk to you because I'm keen to learn about the neuroscience behind the things that I know sort of from an experiential point of view to understand where I'm coming from with a lot of what I'm doing is I always take it back to growing up in East Germany and more so actually getting out before the wall came down because that has massively informed my idea of what's at stake and what risk means and Instead of following the predefined path, I always felt, especially, I don't know, in the Eastern Bloc countries, it was very much like you go up and this and then you go to uni and then you go to work and then you retire if you don't drop that in the meantime. And I've always felt that was like such a rigid way of living. And I always felt, you know, like this big parrot in a tiny cage where you could see what's going on on the outside, but, you know, you didn't have enough space to spread your wings. So I really early knew that I wanted my life to be different than that. And so basically I managed to get out of East Germany. That's a story for another day. But it was literally one of those jumps into, okay, all I knew was I didn't want what I had but I didn't know where I was going. Like I thought it would have to be better than what's here, but literally I didn't know. And it was a one-way ticket. I think that's the piece that really informed any other move I've made because everything I've done afterwards was always, oh, you know, you have the chance to move to Australia. Oh, great. What could possibly go wrong? If I don't like it, I can come back. It's not a one-way ticket. Changing careers. Well, if I don't like the new path, I can go back. I have alternatives. I'm not stuck there. So I've always followed the nudges of inspiration more than avoiding the push of fear. In a sense, I've always been this multi-passionate kind of, you know, lots of interests and lots of aptitudes in different ways. And so I always felt like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I ever sort of focus on one thing? And so I pursued a bunch of different things, always like feeling a little bit guilty about like, what's wrong with me? Until I discovered that, well, I actually always only ever do the same thing. It's all for me, it's always about having an idea and then basically bringing it to life. You know, the first step is to, well, okay, what should that look like? Like, let's just bring this down to earth and then turn it into a plan, take the steps and make it happen. And that always involves learning a bunch of skills. I get bored quite easily, so I will always look for something that has a steep, steep learning curve. So that whole process of learning and creating is really what it's all about for me. And it just has taken a bunch of different shapes over the years. When you build a business, I think that's so relevant and I think not really talked about enough that it is actually a, like getting better at how we learn and how we create is a massive toolkit. It's a superpower. Yeah, so I really like your business plan, which is simply, let's see what happens. <laughs> I identify with that. Like, this is not my first career either, right? I started this late. I started as a, an accountant and because that was a safe a job with security, but it didn't ignite my passion. And so then, uh, then I went back to school and all the way to a PhD in neuroscience and that ignited my passion and it still does. So I can absolutely identify with you, Anka. The funny thing about that is, the reason that I thought, let's just see what happens, was that I think coming from the software developer background, I was keenly aware that anything that would be on a business plan is just a bunch of assumptions. Like I was so keenly aware of that, that I had no way of predicting or I had like anything. I downloaded templates for business plans. <laughs> like literally I did try, you know, but I saw it as like, well, I have no way of knowing especially with my idea of doing something I hadn't really done before in a country that I didn't know anything about. So it was like, I have no way of knowing. I didn't even know whether Spanish flamenco dancer would even consider hiring a German hobby dressmaker to get their costumes made. Like, I didn't know, like, you can't research that. So I thought, I don't know whether this has a chance of working and I don't really care in a sense. Like, I just wanted it out of my system. So it, I think it's not as 
crazy or arbitrary as it sounds, you know, because it was literally, I recognized that all I had was assumptions and I had to put some experiments out to actually see whether this has legs or not. I I know that we're supposed to be talking about taking the pressure off today, but I like where this is going for the moment. And that is about plans and goals, right? I think the business world is really big on these plans and five-year goals and things like that. And I've never been a fan of that. I've never made a five-year goal at all. I have goals, but probably for the next three months or the next six months, right? And so it's less of an assumption. Yes. Like I remember posts on LinkedIn that had massive amounts of engagement and lots of pushback because it was titled Goals Are Stupid. Ooh, <laughs> that ruffled a few feathers. And I stand by that because the way I see it, I think we're very much in, in line. It's not that I'm floating through life. I have my ideas of how I want my life to be. But it looks to me that I'm on an Everest expedition and I know where the summit is. Right. But there, I also know that there are lots of different ways of getting there and that every corner I turn, a new perspective opens up and new opportunities might show up or something that I thought was certain actually isn't. So I just allow a lot more flexibility in that. And the other piece where I'm seeing and I see it a lot with clients where people set goals and then they kind of go and really push themselves really hard and they allow these goals to turn into drill sergeants. They kind of forget that it's a made up milestone with an arbitrary deadline and then they use it to put themselves under pressure (laughs) because they think that pressure is the only way that they'll ever get anything done. And I'm not agreeing. And they can lock themselves in. And they do. Yeah. So what are the first things that come to your mind as you listen to what I said in the opening about resting and recharging? I just loved hearing the evidence for it because it's definitely my experience. I get my best ideas when I'm out with the dogs, you know, or when I'm walking or even when I used to still like make flamenco costumes when I'm sitting there and like at the overlocker and finishing outer edges of ruffles, which is kind of like, you know, it's almost like driving where you can't totally take your mind off but it doesn't require your full concentration it's almost like seems that opens the floodgates of ideas and for me walking does the same trick and to allow that space for your almost like getting out of the way to let your brain make the connections and allow those different connections to be formed or I think that is definitely my experience for sure When I was working in software development, I was working in a big bank and I was working on a project and I really wanted to, it was the first time I really saw it like so clearly that it really hit me and I've never forgotten it since then. And it was, I was working on this piece of code and I wanted to, oh, let me just compile this bit. And then I go home and on Monday I start working on the next thing. And it just wouldn't compile it. Anything I did and no error message, error message. And I was getting more and more <laughs> like agitated. And everybody in the office, see you, see you Monday, see you Monday, bye. And I was, no, 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 I'm going to stay here until that's done. Like really sort of pit bull mode. <laughs> I think it was about 9 p.m. The security guard comes in and he goes, sweetie, you've got to go. And I'm like, no, 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 leave me here. I just want to finish this thing. And he goes, nope. And he said, we need to close the office, lock up the office doors. You can't stay here. So he kicked me out. I wasn't happy. I was grumbling along all the way home. And it was literally the next day I woke up. And in that space between sleeping and being fully awake, I had an idea. I was like, oh, And it just hit me like, you know, like a bolt of lightning. I rushed to the office, literally just typed it in, hit enter, the whole thing compiled. And I'm like, oh, this is how you can basically waste five or six hours. I could have gone home, you know, at four o'clock, had a nice afternoon off instead of almost like when I'm hitting a wall, instead of trying to bang my head against it harder, (laughs) I learned that day that my best bet is to actually walk away and allow some space and allow my brain to do the work without me being there with a whip behind it. Yeah, I have similar stories to you. When I was working on my dissertation, there were days that I devoted, okay, today I'm going to stay home and I'm going to write. I'd write one page and be frustrated by the end of the day because I could not force myself to write more. 
So then I changed my tactic. I love math. <laughs> and so what I started to do then was whenever I got stuck in my writing, I'd go and I'd do some statistics, right? Statistics was in the same way as, as your flamenco sewing thing. It was almost automatic. And after half an hour or so, oh, I'd have, I'd get unstuck, right? Yeah. And so I still do that today. Like when I'm writing and if I get stuck, I don't have statistics to do, but I have my accounting to do. <laughs> so I'll uh. switch over to that <laughs> and then come back. Or if it's late in the afternoon, just let it go for the day. And in the morning, it is amazing the progress that I can make when I was stuck the night before. So true. And ever since that day in the office, I've been quite conscious. The moment I feel stuck, I'm like, okay, I'm going to give myself five minutes of headbanging here and then I'll walk away. And I find it's incredibly reliable. I don't think it's ever not worked, you know? So that idea of let's just take the pressure off. And I find that when I see when I'm writing, I sometimes feel, oh, I'm a little stuck. And you know, then I have this urge to like tinker around on Facebook for a bit. And I've started to realize that, you know, when I give myself permission to just go and tinker on Facebook for a bit, instead of like, oh my God, I need to uninstall. It's a distraction. I need to uninstall the app, right? So I'm just like, oh, let me just switch off for a second and tinker around somewhere else invariably. Two minutes in and I realize, oh, I just needed that little off switch for a second for that thought to form. I then it's almost like I've come to the point where I give myself ruthless permission to allow to just follow those nudges. If I feel like walking away, I will. If I feel like tinkering on social media, I will. And I find every time I'm trying to, and I do encourage clients to give this a go, like, you know, take some time off when they try and work really hard. And sometimes like it's not working and it's not fast enough. And you can tell the more of a sense of urgency they feel. It's like the more tense they are, the less progress they make. But the interesting piece I find is every time I say, so, you know, when's the last time you've had some time off? Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, I did something on Saturday, but like we had family come. Like, no, you're still doing stuff you're supposed to do, right? So this is still not really taking time off and allowing yourself to not think about work. Because sometimes it's even if they're not working in the back of their mind, it's like, I should really be working. So it's like how hard that is when people are conditioned and educated from a young age, I assume, to have this, you've got to work really hard. And if it's hard, you just have to push harder to actually let go of that. And there's always the sense that if I don't give myself these tough guide rails and if I don't put on all that pressure I'm going to fall apart and crumble and I'm saying well actually you know what you're going to find you get a lot more done with a lot more ease and they really struggle to give themselves enough permission to even try it out to even get a chance to experience it but when they do they never go back <laughs> So your clients do find it hard to allow more downtime. Absolutely. And my theory, I don't know whether you've got the science for that, but I find that people in the States probably struggle the most with that, right? People in Spain, they have no trouble like this. Like, you know, so, I mean, I don't work with people locally, but obviously I've been living in Spain for 20 years. So I'm the crazy workhorse here, right? But compared to what people do in the States, I'm a lady of leisure, right? So I've not had anybody in Europe feel guilty about taking a Sunday off or taking a weekend off, but clients in the States regularly feel guilty, even if they go, you know, out for a meal on a Sunday. Well, but I have so much work to do. I should have really worked, right? So they find it really, really hard. So are you able to get them to schedule in some downtime? I usually do. Yes. My approach to that is I will make any step so tiny until even their monkey mind can't talk them out of it. Right. So if I'm initially, I'm saying, okay, take Christmas off and they go, oh my God, I couldn't possibly do that. Right. Then we go down. Well, take a week off, you know, take a day, take a Sunday, take a Sunday afternoon, take one hour after lunch on a Sunday. You can't tell me you can't do that. So I know you don't need a lot of time. So I will negotiate and go down until they go, oh, well, I can do that, right? And it's usually sort of a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon. They'll go, yeah, oh, I could possibly, you know, and once they get hooked, literally the one client who was most resistant 
that's quite funny because he's going to listen to this for sure. <laughs> he was like, initially, I kind of had to work hard to get him to take a couple of hours. The other day he says, you know what? I was thinking I'm going to take August off. Wow, that's amazing. So do you find that rather than just taking, so they might start with just taking an hour or two off on a Sunday, but do you find that they schedule in more downtime? during the week, right? And it doesn't have to be long, like you said, it could be a walk around the block. However, it's not helpful if it's a walk around the block and you keep thinking, right, about your work, but it could be as quick as that. I mean, definitely with anybody I can think of, they have, because the thing is, when they actually, the first time they try it, invariably, they're just like, oh my God. <laughs> and I remember when they're first like, oh, one would say, you know what? I've not slept like that in years. I've like allergies has gone away. It's like, oh my God, my I'm I've actually gotten faster and better in my work. You know, so it's like they get they get really quickly how that isn't a waste of time, how that isn't distracting from what they're doing. And so even the person who sort of said, Well, okay, I'm on a Sunday, a couple of hours, he came back and he goes, You know what happened? All of a sudden I had this idea and I thought we could do this and we could do that. And he was all excited. And ideas, that's the thing. Those connections had been made. So he now realizes, well, actually, this is like a very clever strategy. This isn't almost like me being naughty and doing something I shouldn't be doing. It's actually in my best interest to make time for this because this is what creates the space and what creates the ease to move along much faster and easier than if you just kind of keep banging your head against the wall. Exactly. And business is more fun than when you schedule in that downtime. I say schedule in, but I mean, I don't schedule in my downtime. It's just when I get stuck, I know, okay, it's time to let it go and uh, either do something completely different or really just go out and have a walk or something like that. There's something interesting that you mentioned earlier, and it was how you had an idea in that period between awake and sleep. So that is called N1 sleep. So N1 sleep is that period just before you fall asleep. And most people will have that idea by accident, but you can systematize it in a way. And so as you're falling asleep, let's say for a nap in the afternoon, and I'm a big believer in naps too, right? Because that it's the same as sleep, right? So as you're trying to fall asleep, you should hold something in your hand like car keys. And then once you fall asleep, the car keys will drop and it'll wake you up. And if you have an idea, you can capture that idea. That's so cool. I'm going to try that out. <laughs> yeah. So there are people with narcolepsy where they just fall asleep spontaneously. There is a professor at Harvard. He has narcolepsy and he refuses to take medication for it. And so he can't drive. He lost his driver's license, but he's created 50 companies. And he attributes that to his narcolepsy, to that period just before he falls asleep. That's where he gets all of his ideas. And as I said in the introduction, often those ideas are better. They're more accurate than the ideas that we get through thinking about them. Of course, I mean, you have to think about things because that's the fuel or that's the information for the brain. And then the brain will take that and work with that. So, and it's in diverse areas that he has these ideas. Like some of them are really like truly outstanding. So everybody can do that. That's fascinating because I've seen documentaries on it where people would literally, while they're eating, they just kind of fall. So, and it happens like quite a lot. So, so that moment of falling asleep where you and me have that once a day, and maybe if we take a siesta, maybe twice, he'll have that 20 times a day. And the problem with us is that then we fall asleep and we wake up in the morning and we've lost whatever it was that are mine, right? And so that is the benefit of having something like car keys or house keys, right? That will drop and wake you up. And then you can capture that. Ooh. I'm going to try that out. I'll let you know. <laughs> Do you talk to your clients about getting a good night's sleep? When I feel that they are tired, they kind of do too much, then definitely it's a, yeah, hell yeah. Because I've noticed, I mean, that's something, yeah, when I had my sewing business, there were like way too many <laughs> work through nights. And boy, do you notice when you don't have enough sleep, how that impacts how you operate and, you know, you're just not at capacity. 
Exactly, because the research shows that you're only going to get these great ideas if your brain is rested. Right? And so if you're lacking sleep, right, and a lot of people do that, a lot of people think that they can sleep four to five hours a night and then still perform well the next day. And that's just not true. I mean, it is true that genetically some people only need four to five hours of sleep, but for most of us, it is the seven to nine hours that we need. And the other thing, too, is that if you're tied to a to-do list, and it's not that to-do lists are wrong, right? Because we do need to have some to-dos for the day. But if you're completely tied to your to-do list, then you're not leaving that time for inspiration. Actually, it's funny. If you look at my calendar, there's like, you know, it's got sort of different colors for things. And it feels like it looks really packed, but it's got a big chunk every single day, like, I call it focus time or whatever, like where nobody can book in, where I can just create and write and let my mind wander. And, you know, like I've gotten to see that if I don't have that time, you just end up running on a hamster wheel, you know, because you don't ever really create anything new. You kind of almost like you don't have time, you don't have heads, but it's not even like the physical time, it's the head space. If that's taken up by things all the time, you end up, operating in the same manner all the time because you need that for you to even think about what you might want different and how you could go about that so uh, yeah I've definitely got big chunks blocked out every single day yeah I think you're great encouraging your clients to take time out because many coaches don't do that I think I've heard that from clients on more than one occasion like one actually literally said it to me he says you know what I've worked with so many coaches and everybody I've ever worked on puts pressure on in some way, right? There's here's stuff to do. Here's accountability. Like, have you done the thing? Have you not? And he goes like, you're the opposite. Like you take pressure off, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, because we just function better, right? Even like muscles, when muscles are relaxed, you know, you can stretch further. You kind of, they're stronger. Like if, you, if anything that's tense is kind of fragile and rigid. And I think that works for our minds as well. So, and the funny thing is he would come on in the beginning very much like, oh, I'm a procrastinator. I don't ever do things. And I'm like, that's not true. Like you're here, like you've never missed a call. <laughs> that's not right. And then he goes, oh, I was supposed to do that video, but I didn't. And I'm like, okay, whatever. We'll do it now. And then we could really see his face. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, so he kind of almost expected to be told off or to be like, no, no, you have to work more. You have to do more. And I'm like, What's the point of beating yourself up? Because when you're in flow writing or creating anything, you get so much done and, you know, and you can work and you don't feel drained at the end of it, right? And so if I say, well, you didn't do the thing, well, let's just work off the assumption that your mind hasn't finished digesting things yet. Just get out of the way. What if what you think is procrastinating, what if that just is giving your brain the time to make the connection it needs to make for you to be able to move forward without hesitation? And he goes, oh. And the moment the pressure's off, the moment he can like, okay, so if that video isn't done this week, well, nothing happens, <laughs> you know, like let's do it next week. All of a sudden he has that space. And next he goes, well... Actually, it was a good thing we didn't do it then because now I've got something else and we can do it differently, which is actually much better than the original plan because that happens a lot as well. Yeah. What's the theory behind that? That you don't get what you want and you're like a little bit disappointed and then you think, oh, actually, it was just a stepping stone because what came after that was actually much better than the initial plan. Well, your brain is always working on it. If you feed it that information, so if it's something that's important to you, your brain will continue working on it in the background, like you won't even notice, right? So do you have like a client success story, like how their business just started to take off when they started to take time out? Oh, well, several. <laughs> like one was actually like the one that I like really think of fondly. She's been my client since, you know, for the last nine years or something. So she was literally like, okay, over Christmas, I'm just going to allow myself to relax into, you know, and just follow whatever nudges I feel. She came back. That was the first thing. Oh, you know what? I had digestive issues. They're gone. She said, you know what? The quality of my work has improved. Right. 
And she says, actually, I get stuff done a lot faster. Then there was other projects that she'd been sort of really pushing to achieve. And all of a sudden, you know what? I got a call. <laughs> you know, I talked to this friend and all of a sudden we have this idea for this podcast and it's all in motion, right? So it's almost like the hurdle from idea to being in motion kind of melts away when you're not pushing so hard. So yeah, this one's on a roll. She is absolutely on a roll. It's almost like in dating, when you stop trying so hard, things happen, you know, and it's kind of that, like when you're almost more relaxed and there's that, it hasn't got like your whole way of operating hasn't got that needy feel to it, that like, oh, I really need to make this happen and I need it to be this way. Otherwise, I'm not going to be good enough or not whatever. So the moment you bring more permission, more allowing into this whole thing, all of a sudden stuff falls into place. It's almost like all the overthinking, everything that comes with this tense way of operating, that drops away. It's what I teach my students. And the research shows we really can only put in four to six hours of hard cognitive work in a day. After that, our brain is tired. And the research that I'm thinking about had these participants do these hard tasks for six hours in the day. And then they had to make decisions throughout the day. And they found that as they got closer to the six hours and after the six hours, they were making decisions that were easier and more immediate, where the reward was more immediate, right? Whereas before, when they started in the morning, they could wait, right? Where the reward was bigger, but they would have to wait and do some extra work to get that reward. By the end of the day, They were just making quick decisions. Easy, now, immediate, no extra work. That's fascinating. Actually, I just read an article on LinkedIn the other day, and it was about recruiters. Like when they go through resumes, it's the same thing. They basically said, it's almost like whether you get an interview depends on how tired the recruiter is on the day. They literally said when they first come in in the morning and they're fresh and they start going through and I've experienced that (laughs) when I was still in corporate that, you know, when you sort of still fresh, there will be a resume and you look like, oh, you know, where could the transferable skill be here? You know, so after 70 resume, it's like, yep, got that tick, tick, yes, no, out. And you could like, oh, I've experienced that. And definitely that was the whole point of that big quarters article. Yeah, that makes so much sense, though. It's the same with judges. Judges give more lenient sentences first thing in the morning. And again, after lunch, and then progressively because of their break. Until the break, their sentences get progressively harder. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I've been on Duolingo learning French for 795 days. So, but it's an experiment. I don't really need French for anything, right? And now like this has been the most fascinating experiment because almost like it takes that whole concept of Don't push too hard and allow enough space for your brain to do the work and like just take your fingers out of the machinery. This way actually takes it quite to the extreme, right? And I'm not pretending I'm fluent in French by any means, but I've only ever put five to 10 minutes a day. So it's fascinating how powerful that is because it's almost like there's no rush in it. But over time, I'm thinking I've not put any effort in at all. It's just a game I play for a few minutes every day. It's the same reasoning, right? You, you do your 10 minutes and then you go on to something else, right? So it's kind of like my dissertation and then working on my statistics. Or you do your 10 minutes and then you go to bed, right? So your brain works on it overnight to solidify the memory. That's what it does if at night. But if it's during the day and then you do something else, I mean, your brain's still working at it. Yeah. And it's fascinating because it feels like this is effortless. You know, it just sort of sinks in. It feels like I'm not really doing anything, you know? Yeah. So finally, is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners? I think the main thing that I would love people to never forget, it's that working harder isn't going to get you there faster. It's this slow down to speed up. It's if you've never even considered it, I would definitely want to, you know, invite you or call a challenge to actually give it a try. Because if you've operated for decades sometimes under this, like, oh, I need to work harder. If I'm not where I want to be, I need to put in more effort, more time, more, you know, push, push. Then it's not going to come naturally. But I would definitely want to give it a try because once you've experienced it, you're not going to go back. No, I mean, I built my business on four hours a day. 
right? I suffer from anxiety and that's all I could do was four hours a day. And I had originally thought, no, you can't build a business on four hours a day. Well, yes, you can. So what's the best way for listeners to learn more about you and what you do? Well, my website's a good place to start. It's ankeherman.com. That's A-N-K-E-H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N.com. If you're interested in playing, if you want to have a bit of a go, a bit of an experience, you can go to theentrepreneurialexperiment.com. And there's a literally a little, wee little mini course that you can take and that just sets up some experiments for you so you could experience what it's like to get away from the push, 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 (laughs) hamster wheel kind of culture. Yeah, that's wonderful. So Anka, thank you very much for your time today. This has been a truly enlightening and fun conversation. Thanks so much for having me. So thank you everyone for listening. As our society becomes ever more connected 24-7, we need to remind ourselves to embrace the value of rest, relaxation, and recovery. The push-ahead, go-go-go mentality that is too common in Western culture, especially among entrepreneurs, is not supported by neuroscience. Prioritize sleep for learning and memory consolidation. Allow space to reflect on new ideas and insights upon waking. Dedicate time to learning and exploration, which the brain will integrate during your sleep. And remember that the brain creates cognitive maps during sleep that will improve your strategic thinking and planning while awake. I'm Dr. Irene O'Brien, and you've been listening to Neuroscience of Coaching. You can find out more about me at neuroscienceschool.com. The Neuroscience of Coaching is a part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Just Between Coaches and To Lead is Human. This episode was produced by Andrew Chapman, Danny Inney is our executive producer, and Marvin Del Rosario is our audio editor. To make sure you don't miss great episodes coming up on Neuroscience of Coaching, please follow us on Miracy FM's YouTube channel or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a comment or a starred review. It's the best way to help us get these ideas out there to more people. Thanks, and we hope you'll join us next time. 